um, it's interesting to catch the back end of your, of your talk there. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, speak here today at the Institute for Economic Affairs, the home of free markets, of course. Um, as uh, you just said, I was... Uh, lucky enough to be appointed by the Prime Minister just a few weeks ago as Minister for Technology and the Digital uh, Economy. He didn't so much ask me to do the job as tell me, obviously, as uh, in the nature of these things. But when he did ask me to move from the Home Office to uh, DCMS as Minister for Tech and Digital Economy, um, I was delighted because my background before uh, entering Parliament six and a half years ago was in setting up and running various different uh, businesses. Uh, one of which was a tech-centred business, which we ended up uh, floating on the stock market and eventually it got taken over by uh, Booker and then by Tesco. So setting up new businesses is something I just spent 15 uh, or 17 years doing before, um, before entering Parliament. You can imagine going from doing that to Parliament was quite a shock to the, quite a shock to the system. Um, and look, it's very clear that uh, a, a free market, dynamic, innovative economy is... A, a critical uh, thing for our country to foster and develop. All kinds of benefits obviously flow from a dynamic, competitive, free market economy, uh, ranging from uh, wealth creation and employment creation, most obviously, uh, through to innovation. It improves the quality of people's lives. Uh, but of course, it goes beyond that as well, as, as, as Hayek argued in his seminal book, The Road to Serfdom, that you know, free, free markets and a free economy are actually essential um, for, for freedom itself as well well. So um, both as an entrepreneur and as a sort of free market conservative, um, that, you know, I'm a huge supporter of, of light touch government and uh, a huge supporter of, of, of economic and of course other, other freedoms as well. And I think few sectors better exemplify those freedoms at their best than the tech sector, where because it is so new, because it's so dynamic, because it's so uh, innovative, uh, we see those characteristics, and because it's very lightly regulated compared to other sectors, um, we see those uh, characteristics at their best. And the UK is a, is, is, you know, a global leader um, in, this, in this area. If we look at things like, um, I don't know, artificial intelligence, for example, which I'm responsible for um, as, as well, um, you know, we are uh, clearly the European leaders, and we're uh, behind only the US and China uh, globally, if we look at things like uh, you know uh, inward or uh, investment in uh, private tech businesses in the first half of this year, 13 and a half billion pounds was invested in uh, private UK tech businesses. That was by far the largest number of any European country. It was twice the German figure, which was about six and a half billion. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where the French uh, registered here. I think their tech sector currently is engaged in trying to work out how to dispose of some unexpectedly available obsolete submarines technology, which they <laughs> discovered is suddenly, uh, you're not recording this, sorry, it's suddenly, uh, it's suddenly, suddenly on their hands. Um, so, and look, unicorns, we are, we, we have 105 unicorns, uh, startups that have gone on to achieve a $1 billion valuation. Uh, that is more than Germany, France, and Israel put together. We are giving birth to unicorns, if that isn't too painful an undertaking, um, at the rate, at the phenomenal rate of one a week. So, look, I think our, the, the free market environment in which tech thrives is is uh, doing our country um, is doing our country very proud and my my sort of mission as as tech and digital economy minister is to make sure that continues to flourish there's more we can do around things like i mean i'm slightly getting off topic here but there's more we can do around things like visas for super high skilled people so they can just come in really quickly and there's more we can do to unlock um, institutional capital in things like pension funds, which don't invest as much in the tech sector pre-IPO as they should, 65% of, of, of VC funding in the US comes from pension companies. It's only 12% in the UK. So there's a whole bunch of things we can do um, to get even better than we are um, at the moment. But that isn't what I came to talk about today. I got slightly off topic there, for which I, for which I apologise. Um, what we're talking about today is, is, is competition. And um, clearly, uh, in, any, in any part of the economy, whether digital or otherwise, um, when a particular company or set of companies um, develops um, essentially a monopoly or a near monopoly, all kinds of um, adverse uh, consequences follow. M most obviously, um, you know, the consumers tend to pay uh, much higher prices than they otherwise would. Um, service tends to get worse. Innovation tends to get stifled because the dominant incumbent uh, can squash or exclude any any new market entrance. And we've seen this uh, through the history of the last sort of 150 years. I mean, going back to uh, the late.
late 19th century uh, in, in the USA. Obviously, we know we, we saw their uh, monopolies being created by the so-called robber barons, um, you know, creating companies like Standard Oil, which were enormous monopolies in their in their sector. And um, we saw uh, government created monopolies uh, in in this country. I'm uh, sorry to say, um, in the 20th century, like British Rail. I mean, I can't imagine much of a worse monopoly than British Rail um, with its overpriced, um, appalling service. Um, and there are some, you might almost say natural monopolies, things like uh, you know, pipe networks under the street where you're unlikely to have two competing networks of, of physical infrastructure under the, under the pavement. Um, where you have a natural monopoly. And where those monopolies exist, clearly there is a huge capacity um, for uh, consumers, um, but also society more widely, to suffer. High prices, lack of innovation, worse service. And where those monopolies arise, for whatever reason, I mentioned three reasons, government created, um, sort of create, self-created, like the sort of Robert Barron created, or uh, natural monopolies, um, then I think much though my free market instincts uh, would prefer to turn a blind eye, um, I think there is a role, in fact a, a, an imperative, for the government to take action where those monopolies have got to the point that they are, um, that they are harmful. Clearly, that should be a last resort. It should be done only where absolutely necessary. But I think to do nothing does lead to uh, very adverse consequences, potentially. Uh, so turning to digital markets, um, I think, and if we just sort of take an honest look at where we are with digital markets today, uh, I think it is, it is clear that in some areas, some limited areas, um, monopolies have, or near monopolies, have developed in a way uh, that is potentially harmful. And I think the digital markets do have some unusual characteristics. As a sort of, I mentioned the three categories of monopoly previously, um, privately created, government created, and natural. There is now this sort of fourth category of digital monopoly. Um, and because of the characteristics of the way digital markets work, um, there are huge benefits to scale. There are network effects that become self-reinforcing and uh, you get to a tipping point where everybody else is sort of essentially excluded. So take search as an example. Um, I mean, in the UK, probably across Western Europe, um, but in the UK I can speak for, um, Google has a 90% market share in search. Now that is a that is a virtual um, that is a virtual monopoly, and w where that where that happens, um, consumers just in just just as in the sort of three old types of monopoly, uh, this new fourth monopoly has adverse consequences as well. And the CMA, who I think you heard from this morning at the opening, um, they did a study in July of last year, and they looked at the um, the sort of pricing uh, power being exerted by uh, Google, I think in the case of search and. Facebook in the UK in the case of online display advertising. And they looked at the profits being generated in those areas, and they looked at what a sort of normal return on capital and so on would be. And they calculated that just those two companies, just in those two markets, um, were generating, were effectively overpricing by uh, £2.4 billion a year because of their monopoly or near monopoly status. So that is a, that is a phenomenal um, adverse implication um, for the consumer. Uh, and they also, they also exert monopoly powers in a way that isn't simply um, pricing, which is the most obvious one. Um, but also uh, they can exclude uh, uh, other market participants. They can use their monopoly on data um, to entrench their market position and exclude uh, competitors. Uh, and they can effectively sort of cross-sell so compellingly that not only do they achieve vertical dominance, as Google have in search, but they can start achieving uh, a form of horizontal um, dominance as well into adjacent um, spaces. So if you think back a number of years, uh, Google weren't the first people into, ma into online mapping, right? Right? If you remember back in the early 2000s, there was like StreetMap, which I mean, was rubbish, but it was there. And then uh, Google, you, you know, using its traffic and its data from its search service, like now to dominate, like Google Maps is just like dominant. Um, and they've acquired various competitors. I think they own Waze, don't they, as well now? So they've used acquisitions to basically further um, absorb competitors who might otherwise have challenged their position in, in that case, mapping. So I think we need to be uh, just honest about the fact that monop near monopolies um, have arisen or are arising in this new digital world. In limited circumstances, it's thankfully by no, it's limited, it's quite, quite small in number, but in some places they have, they have developed. And I don't think, as a, in all good conscience, we can to do nothing while UK consumers get overcharged and while innovation gets stifled because either anyone that begins to develop gets purchased or they just don't even start up in the first place. So uh, I think we do need to take a hard look at this. And that's why we published some... Um, emerging proposals in, I think it was in about July, we consulted on it. Consultation closed, I believe, on the 1st of October, and I've, I've got your response printed out here, which I've been diligently, uh, diligently reading. Um, 
and we're going to be thinking carefully about what our response to that is going to be. Um, we want this to be uh, as light touch and as minimal as it possibly can be. Um, the, the idea is to create a, or a, well, have created the digital markets unit within the um, CMA to uh, do a couple of things, to create a code of practice which these very largest firms, will we'll de we'll designate just the largest firms, SMS firms, um, it'll be uh, the criteria, proposed criteria are laid out um, and that could change over time, it's not static. Um, and they'll have to abide by a code of practice which is designed to foster um, actions which are uh, pro-competitive or which ameliorate the effect of monopolies or near monopolies. And uh, secondly, there'll be a set of pro-competitive um, interventions which, will, which are designed to just sort of try and unpick slightly um, the dominant positions which these firms are developing. That might be simple things like um, data sharing or making their platforms more open rather than closed. Um, in extremists, um, it might be um, if, they're, if, they're, if they're basically overcharging like Google are for search, um, it might involve price intervention. That's obviously a sort of very much like the last resort end of the spectrum. Uh, or it might involve um, trying to sort of break up um, entities. Again, that is very difficult in the online world because the companies are so integrated um, um, they're also international, so it's difficult to like. It's not like a, like a network of retail banks where you can just tell RBS to like sell 100 branches. They're obviously inter they're integrated horizontally. They're multinational firms. Their IT is all mixed up. It's actually very hard to do that. Um, but that should not deter us from uh, seeking to take action. And that is why um, we published the consultation. We are now carefully considering the replies. And I guess sometime sort of probably early in the new year, I'm looking at the yes, early in the new year, um, we'll come up with some slightly more tangible proposals. But the principles that will underlie those will be absolute minimum uh, light touch action only where uh, for those ve small number of cases where a monopoly or near monopoly um, has arisen. Uh, there does seem to be some quite uh, sort of widespread support. I know that you've got some reservations about this, but um, I, can <laughs> um, I can see Mark wincing painfully over there. Um, but the, the, the sort of tech sector generally um, have received this reasonably well because obviously the sort of dynamic startup market and growth market um, do, you know, are themselves somewhat overshadowed by the very biggest players and it's, it, is, it is somewhat inhibiting uh, growth elsewhere. But we don't want to overdo this or be heavy-handed about this. There's clearly a source of competitive advantage from the UK is keeping all kinds of regulation um, as light touch as it possibly can be and that, that principle will definitely, um, definitely run through this. Um, I've got time for a, I think a small number of uh, uh, questions this afternoon. Um, but look, in conclusion, just thank you very much for hosting today's event. I was um, very impressed by the calibre of um, participants you managed to recruit um, to today's event. I'm very keen to sort of work with you as the as the IAR, the custodians of, uh, of, of free market uh, liberalism and libertarianism. Very keen to make sure we hear your voice and make sure that um, that I, uh, I don't get I don't get led astray um, over the road in DCMS. So I'm, I'm relying on you to be the, uh, the, the free market conscience. That, uh, that, uh, that speaks into the ear of government, a role you have performed so magnificently for, is it 65, 66 years now? So um, thank you for hosting, and it's been a great pleasure coming today. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you for the, the kind words of support. Uh, I'm sure there's loads of questions. Who would like to ask a question of the minister? Well, I reserve the right, if the, if the question becomes too technical, I reserve the right to turn to either Blake or Francesca, who are the expert officials on this. So they're just sitting over there. I'm quite light, so I can uh, uh, Sorry, uh, Neil Ross from Tech UK. Uh, okay. I'm your speech, Chris. I think one thing we're thinking and thank you for dinner the other night as well, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be all good. Thanks for the capture. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was a big dinner, and I ended up making a charitable donation that far exceeded the value of the dinner, so I definitely, <laughs> I definitely came out of that evening down. <laughs> did, you get the, did you win the thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, in those, in those charity, like, uh, silent auctions, you, like, always win. That's the point, right? Because they're trying to get money off you. But it was a good cause, so that was fine. <laughs> yeah, and my core question is, obviously, when you look at the design of the DMU units, I think you can kind of... You know, like that. So, oh, sorry. You sort of get a sense of who might be the kind of the target firms for this, but obviously when the regime is established, it has the ability to grow and expand. Mm -hmm. I just want to have a question about... What is the accountability mechanism in government to make sure that it remains targeted and focused mm. in those limited cases that you set out that you wanted to fulfil? Mm. I mean, so, so the policy uh, environment in which the DMU will exist is set by DCMS. So DCMS ministers will, uh, who I hope um, you know, will continue to be um, free market in their perspective, uh, will obviously make sure that policy envelope remains um, properly calibrated. The uh, sort of day-to-day -day operation of the... Um, 
CMA is a, is a Bayes um, sort of matter. And obviously, Quasi is someone who um, you know is, is free market orientated and, and is funded by Treasury. So obviously, Treasury's natural parsimony um, tends to circumscribe um, the money available to, to, to expand inappropriately. So you've got you've got sort of um, ministerial uh, accountability lines in those two places. Um, but I think if you can keep the sort of policy remit focused, narrow, essentially, um, I think it will achieve that, um, that, that, that objective of, of proportionality. I'm not sure, Blake or Francesco, if you want to, to add to that. I mean, just to add, Mr. as you said, um, the proposal is that there is an SMS test, uh, and only those firms in specific activities. So um, just to be clear, although we're talking about firms, it is designated activities within those firms. So we're not talking about Alphabet. We are talking about search within Google. Uh, and so uh, only those activities that are evidence-based and can prove that there is entrenched market positions uh, and that they are using those to the detriment of consumers uh, would be designated as SMS firms and those SMS SMS activities within them. The other thing to say is there's also uh, the designation only applies for five years maximum and can be reviewed. And so you wouldn't expect there to be a kind of constant tally of increasing SMS uh, within the regime either. Uh, any more questions? Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. And um, I think I'm going to ask you an almost identical question to the one that I put to our CMA representative this morning. Let's see if we get a different answer. <laughs> um, but my, my question is this. You highlighted this on, on Google. I think you said 90% market share for search engines. I suspect it's even worse than that. Christopher Snowden told me that the most common search term in Ask Jeeves is how do I do a Google search? So even the other 10%, I think, are often di redirecting to Google. But my question is this. Is that the right metric to look at, market share? Does it matter? Uh, or is it largely irrelevant if the barriers to entry are low? As soon as somebody can invent an algorithm that searches faster, deeper, better, with better AI, uh, AI than Google, Google's dust, isn't it? I mean, it's gone overnight. Nobody, it doesn't have any brand loyalty. If I could switch to a search engine that was better than Google, I would. And it's not obvious to me there's any barriers of entry there. So do you actually think market share is the best way of looking at whether there's a problem? Isn't it actually that however big your market share, as long as barriers to entry are low, and in this environment they are, then your market share can atrophy extremely quickly, as is the case I've been pointing out over the last 24 hours or so, as happened with Friends Reunited. I was actually trying to find on Google the Guardian article about Friends Reunited is now a monopoly and must be broken up, but I couldn't find it, because if you put Friends Reunited monopoly into Google, it just tells you that there's now a monopoly version of the board game based on the TV series Friends, so I'm in the market for a better search engine right now. Uh, but isn't that really what you should be looking at, not the market share? but the ability for the market share to fade away simply because somebody else comes up with a better product cheaply, easily. Well, I think Friends Reunited probably got completely squashed by Facebook's near monopoly of reuniting friends, which is sort of what people use Facebook for these days. Um, look, I think your point about, so your, your thesis essentially is that taking Google search as an example, um, the barriers to entry are sufficiently low that somebody could come and wipe them out or take a significant share off them even though their starting point is 90%. So I'm not entirely sure, and by the way, I'm not an expert in search, but I'm, but I'm just going to um, sort of think, think out loud. I'm not sure that necessarily follows in the case of search. I mean, firstly, Google has been doing search now for something like 25 odd years, right? They started off, I think, in the late 1990s. So they have 25 years worth of accumulated IP in search. So the prospect that somebody is going to pop up tomorrow and come up with an algo algorithm um, that, is, that is better than Google's uh, product of 25 years, intensive work, with literally tens of thousands of the brightest people in the world working on it, I think is it requires quite a leap of imagination, if I can put it politely. Um, secondly, their search is based on an enormously large and rich uh, cache of data, which they have which they have sucked from every corner of the every fetid corner of the internet um, over a period again of decades. And a new market entrant would not be able to avail themselves of that, certainly not at any reasonable cost. And then thirdly, um, Google has, I mean, you used, well, they've got their brand. I mean, you just discounted the brand, but I think the brand does, does count for quite a lot. But fourthly, um, they've also got uh, buttressing and entrenching and strengthening their, um, their incumbent position. Um, the, the range of associated services, I mentioned mapping, and there's obviously like 20 or 30 others 
from cloud services to Gmail to goodness knows what else. And the fact they've got that suite of services means they can constantly cross-refer customers between each bit of the Google, um, the Google universe, um, which sort of further um, entrenching their, their, their position. Um, they also have obviously massive amounts of, of data on customers as well, um, which sort of keeps them, keeps them locked in. So I think for all of those, so all of those things um, are not market share themselves, but they're sort of consequences of market share. And they're certainly consequences of Google's like enormous dominant position across a whole range of, uh, of areas. So, and you're probably right, market share isn't the only me metric, but I think in the case of Google, for search, I'd find it quite hard to believe that they're going to get knocked over by anyone else um, anytime soon. I think I think early on in, in as emerging technologies come out, like in the first, I guess, like five years, it's quite fluid. I mean, Yahoo was pretty big in search back in and, and, and in email back in the late 90s, and they have basically got squashed. Um, so I think it's quite fluid. And if you think back, you know, as, as um, smartphones came out, obviously BlackBerry did really well for a time, and they're obviously like you know, disappeared now. So I think in the first kind of five years of a new technology, it can be quite fluid. But I think once people get entrenched beyond that, I'm guessing five year period, it, they get quite hard to knock out. Like I can't see I like the iPhone getting knocked out anytime soon. Well, that's what Nokia said. <laughs> well, no, with Nokia, they, so Nokia, they failed to innovate, right? You're being, okay, right. in that case, I'll rise above it. Um, <laughs> just, just to be clear though, to answer the question directly, the market share is not the SMS test. So the SMS test is in two factors. One is substantial and entrenched market power, and the other one is that there are um, a strategic position in the market. And I think the minister is explaining that um, it is not the market share, it is the strategic position in search that Google um, exists that might lead it to be designated, not its market share. That was a very elegant example of what the minister meant to say was X. <laughs> um, Renato, let's go to the back. Uh, Renato Nazzini, King's College, London. <coughs> um, uh, one suggestion that in the consultation paper, which is, I think, concerning to most lawyers, is that the um, uh, judicial review of, of the Digital Market Unit's actions, whatever they, mi they might be, could be, and I appreciate this is emerging thinking, but could be on judicial review principles rather than on the merits appeals as it is now under the Competition, uh, competition Act. Um, and that is, seems to me is not in line with the Competition Act regime, which we have now. And also, although the, I appreciate the objective is to have a light touch uh, approach to regulation, some of this com pro-competitive intervention can be, of course, quite draconian, you know, up to breaking up companies. So. Um, why this idea that actually we should reduce the standard of review from what we have now in competition law more generally, from on the merits appeals to judicial review, when we have the competition mm. appeal tribunal, which is a specialist mm. tribunal, uh, perfectly equipped mm. to look at these things? Well, that is a very interesting question, um, which I'm going to refer over there in a minute. <laughs> but um, that, that's a really good point. I, I, will, I will take that away and, and genuinely look into that further. All I, all I would observe is that uh, although traditionally, historically, going back to so 10, 20, 30 years, uh, the, the grounds for bringing judicial review were quite narrow, they have over time, regrettably, become massively expanded. My last job in the Home Office was as um, I was responsible for illegal immigration, um, which was a pretty thankless task, as you can imagine. And we got about 7,000 judicial reviews a year. I was the most judicially reviewed minister in the government. And the grounds, which I, I guess is not something to be proud about, um, and, um, and, and the, the, the way you can bring JR now has become substantially widened. I mean, you know, disproportionality, when's be unreasonableness, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and we, and the Home Office get, used to get, and probably still get, um, JR'd on particular matters where there's no statutory appeal right on, on grounds that, you know, JR grounds are, to all intents and purposes, the merits of the case, but under the guise of disproportionality, unreasonableness, and so on and so forth. Um, however, you are nonetheless raising an extremely important and interesting point, particularly if other areas of competition do benefit from a statutory right of appeal, presumably to the, of, uh, there's a, the, to the relevant tribunal. Um, so I'd be interested to hear any, any, any views on that from Francesca. Uh, 
thank you very much. Um, it's a very interesting question, and it's one that we've actually paid a lot of attention to during during policy development. So firstly, uh, a bit of a clarification. So the position we were trying to put forward in the, the consultation document, and apologies if this wasn't clear, was that the DMU will be making a wide range of decisions throughout its processes, and that we think for some of those decisions, judicial review would be the most proportionate appeal standard uh, to use. We did, however, also reference in that consultation document that in some cases, it may be that full merits review is more appropriate for the decision that has been made. And it was something we invited views on and will be scrutinising uh, responses on quite carefully. Um, you referenced the fact that the Competition Act uses um, full merits review. Uh, obviously, when we're designing this regime, we're drawing from a number of different uh, sources. We need to make sure that the regime is coherent with the CMA's wider activity as an ex post competition uh, authority. But we also need to make sure that the regime is coherent with the UK's wider economic regulatory framework. And therefore, if you look at uh, regulators such as Ofcom, which obviously uh, DCMS has a, a broad interest in, uh, full merits review is not necessarily the, the appeal standard that is used, for example, the SNP regime. So we're drawing on a number of different sources. Uh, we're scrutinising all responses very carefully. But certainly, the message we intended to convey through that consultation is that we're open to views um, and that the appeal standard that is suitable for one of the DMU's decisions will not necessarily be uh, most appropriate for all of them. I know you flagged it, and thinking about my experience in the Home Office, which also had a mix of statutory appeal rights and JR only. Right, so some of the, some of the you know, like, a, like an asylum decision had a statutory appeal right uh, with for a merits-based review. Other things like a modern slavery decision, for example, did not. That was JR. So I'm, I'm very familiar with having a mix of appeal routes. Uh, and now you've expressly flagged it, for which I'm extremely grateful. This, is, this has made the visit worthwhile on its own. Um, I'm now going to pay express attention to uh, which matters fall into which category. Thank you. Excellent. I think we can squeeze one more question in. Does anyone have a burning issue? Philip. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's really on this question of how entrenched monopolies are. And by, by the way, if you, do your Google, if you do your Google search instead on Microsoft Bing, you'll find the responses that you need, Mark. I know it's always dangerous to use the argument that uh, on so many other occasions people have been concerned about monopolies and then they have quickly been dissipated as a result of some technological development transcending what these uh, monop parent monopoly companies do. But th no, there is a remarkable trend in terms of, of that happening. When I first came to the IEA, uh, or a few years after that maybe, you know, the, all the concerns were about companies like Tesco and so on. Now nobody's really concerned about Tesco, but though they may be about Amazon. So no, isn't it a, 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 the case that, by and large, the, um, these companies who have these monopoly positions um, become uninnovative over time, lazy, flabby, including, of course, all the public sector monopolies with which uh, the Thatcher government uh, had to deal, or, um, actually more likely, become transcended by some technological development which just makes, which we can't envisage or imagine, of course, which just makes what Google does currently um, irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, the, the economy is a very, thankfully, is a dynamic living thing and you know if you look at the composition of the FTSE 100 like 20 I think somebody did analysis if you look at the FTSE 100 20 years ago only a very small proportion of companies in it then are in it now. Right? So it's a huge um, dynamic turnover, which is a very good thing. It's a sign of dynamism. It's a sign of innovation. It's a sign of progress. Um, but of course, but the SMS decision-making regime, and we are talking, going to be talking about a very small number of companies, that is reviewed continuously. And if in the future, like five years' time, say, for the sake of argument, Google search has been blasted away by some new thing we can't even think of, then obviously uh, Google search would drop off the list of SMS-related um, uh, you know, it wouldn't be an SMS uh, designated uh, function any longer. But what would have happened is for that intervening period, whether it's one year or five years or ten years or who knows what, um, the consumers would have been protected from the overpricing uh, that Google search is currently inflicting upon us. Um, so I think that is the mechanism by which we'll reflect the dynamism you're describing. But you know what, I mean, two and a half billion pounds, two companies, Google and Facebook, overcharging us by two and a half billion pounds a year, that is a serious thing. And for as long as that persists, whether it's one year or ten years, I think it is reasonable that we try and get that, um, get that sorted out. But as soon as Google gets blasted away, they'll lose the SMS designation. Could be, but it could be the overcharging which encourages the innovation which destroys the Google. Well, I mean, that's how a normal market would work. But when you get an entrenched monopoly, and the test is, as Blake uh, 
as Blake said, an entrenched monopoly, those normal uh, pricing signals where super profits um, attracted new entrants, you know, the, the whole point is the definition of entrenched monopoly is that market mechanism doesn't work any longer because of the entrenchment, hence the need for limited, light touch, carefully calibrated, not too many people um, action as currently contemplated. <laughs> well, thank you very much to the Minister and team. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.